and then Eric Corona, the program manager for Clean California. Uh, Clean California is a $1.1 billion statewide initiative to beautify the Caltrans right-of-ways uh, here in California, talking freeways, uh, off-ramps, uh, city uh, Caltrans owned uh, built, um, land, including the court referral lot at First and Mayberry, or sorry, Mayberry, um, and uh, right across the street, right, right across First Street from the zoo. Uh, to give more information, I'm going to uh, bring up Eric Corona, who is, like I said, the program manager for Clean California. Well, good evening. Thanks for being here. I am Eric. I'm with Caltrans. And uh, I'm just glad you're here. Uh, we don't usually do outreach this early on in a project, uh, but I want to make sure you all are aware of investments that we're considering, beautification-specific investments along I-5 near Saddleback, so you all are aware of this. And eventually, when we design it, uh, we can come back to you and basically tell you, hey, here are designs we're considering. What's your input? So that uh, beautification we're doing in your own backyard you guys have a vested interest in how it looks down the road. Uh, so uh, I'll start out by just giving a, um, do we have a presentation up or um, giving some examples statewide. Yeah. Excuse me. Is, yeah. the Zoom, is, is the Zoom working now? The Zoom is listed on, yes. Because I'm getting texts from people that they can't get in. Sorry. They can't get in? Shall we continue? Zoom is on. Zoom is on. Are you admitting people? We don't have a waiting Okay, perfect. perfect. All right. And for those joining via Zoom, welcome. We're glad you're here too. Uh, so um, here behind me, I don't. It's very small, but the idea here is you have at the top examples of um, places along freeways that can be unsightly, right? And then below that is how you can reimagine it. So, for example, the one on the left, it's, uh, you know, a place where the freeway crosses under a local street, right? And those slopes can be places where trash collects and things like that. So one way that the Central Valley is envisioning those places is, you know, do some nice slope paving on the sides uh, where, the, where the bridge touches down, and then um, maybe do some painting along the actual face of the bridge so that uh, it'll give it some identification, some flavor, make it look nicer. So these are examples from other locations in the state. I'm hoping right now to zero in on what are we thinking in terms of, uh, in terms of the corridor near Saddleback. So can you go to the next slide real quick? Okay. Yeah, so uh, to give some context to this, um, here at Caltrans District 12, the jurisdiction is Orange County. And we have a beautification portfolio to beautify state highways uh, to the tune of $20 million. We have to get that all constructed in two years. So it's a very compressed timeline. Um, but one of the projects, as you can see in the red lines, it goes, uh, it is uh, basically where I-5 hits 55, that interchange, and it spreads out a bit, right, from there on I-5 from Red Hill all the way up to 57. And then 55 from Edinger all the way up to um, Fairhaven. And so you can see there, um, you know, Saddleback is of course like right dead center in the middle there. Uh, but we're hoping to invest 20, uh, of the 20 million, uh, $2 million in beautification investments just in this interchange alone. Um, it, uh, yeah, it's gonna, be a, it's gonna be a critical kind of, you know, this is the county seat. This is a great place to kind of show not not just Orange County and, and you know the flavor here and the identity here and the beautification we can do, but more specifically, it's going to run through Santa Ana. So how do we, how do we make sure that Santa Ana uh, gets the uh, recognition it needs as well? So let's go to the next slide. Uh, we're going to zero in on the zoo, 
so first street crosses I-5, and then you got Mayberry on the backside, kind of makes a triangle. That triangle is a lot that Caltrans owns, so we're hoping to uh, give it a facelift, some tender loving care, if you will. Uh, it, some of it's unpaved. Uh, it's been a while since it's been paved, period. Uh, the fencing's very, very uh, low maintenance, chain link fencing. And what we're hoping is, you know, the city's planning <clears throat> um, uh, to put in residential development, kitty corner to that. And then the zoo, who's celebrating the 70th anniversary, is going to do some uh, do some beautification along the road, some landscaping, things like that. So we want to comport our plans with those plans. Take this first street lot. Now, by the way, the lot um, is used for the local work program, right? People who, you know, maybe have been sentenced to jail time, have some fines to pay, can offset that by, you know, doing some community service, picking up some trash on the side of the road. They sign up for that, want to volunteer. They park here, and then we shuttle them to different places throughout the county to pick up that litter. Now, um, this lot, obviously, if we do development in the area, well, it's going to be kind of not aligned. So our hope is to align the lot with the beautification enhancements already happening at the location. Uh, and those, those include things like landscaping, um, beautifying the sidewalk a bit, uh, enhancing the, the, the access control or the fencing in that area, uh, and then just repaving it, making it look nice, uh, maybe even using the landscaping to uh, shaded a bit from, from people who are passing by. So if we go to the next slide, please. So here are some renderings. Uh, this is a street view on the left, and then some renderings on the right. Uh, because it's across the street from the zoo, we thought a nice zoo theme would be, would be cool. Um, of course, we don't want people to think like that zoo parking, so there would have to be some wayfinding signs and things like that. But um, our hope is to do some drought-resistant native planting. You know, we're in a drought, so we need to be sensitive to that. And then some uh, zoo-themed decorative fencing uh, is the hope. So that's sort of the plan there. And if we go to the next slide, I can talk about, yeah, so a lot of text here, but, but essentially what this slide is saying is we aren't just going to focus on the lot. We're also going to focus on the main line um, freeways, so I-5 and 55. And where it's, uh, I think where the river meets the road for Saddleback specifically is um, you have some, some areas where maybe the street cul-de-sacs or dead ends at, at Caltrans property, um, East Side, Sixth Street, places like that. So, um, so our hope is, you know, there's a chain link fence there. There's maybe some access control issues, maybe some, you know, illegal access. Oh, thank you. Let's see if this works. Does this work? Yeah. So, so, so our hope is we would take uh, we would take that fencing there, the chain link fencing that you know gets cut all the time or whatnot, and we replace it with something uh, something more durable, uh, perhaps some wrought iron or something like that. So uh, that's also in scope. And then there are some locations where you know either you know the local street goes over the freeway or you know another. I think 55 has an HOV connector that comes in. Some some slopes in the area that are either bare soils or they're, you know, the slopes haven't been paved in a while. So we'd be looking at doing some decorative paving there to reflect the identity of, of the local community as well. So, and I'll give some examples in the next slide if we can go to that. Yeah, so brought to our attention from the city and I just want to thank um, Monica and, and Nabil and everyone on the city side who's really come to the table with, that t with us to identify what these needs are um, as we develop the concept scope. And, uh, and really help us figure out where the value add, where the value add is, right? So you'll see on the upper right, on the upper left, you have the sign that says, you know, City of Santa Ana, and then you have a sign that says Santa Ana Zoo. And, you know, it, it, doesn't look, it doesn't look great. So there's a lot of area for improvement here. And our hope is, you can see on the right, uh, the orange brush, we've done some decorative painting with some, you know, four inches. Um, obviously, we wouldn't want to be you know, too narrowed in on those oranges themselves, but the idea is, you know, whatever best reflects the community, you know, Santa Ana, Saddleback, we want to make sure that that uh, is taken into consideration when we're, uh, when we're developing the, uh, the slopes and how they look. So, uh, yeah, you see they're kind of weedy and stuff, so uh, I think that would go a long way. 
Um, and then next slide, please. Yeah, so I, I'm going to end here with a quick note on the project timeline, just to give you an idea of when you're going to see me again. <laughs> so uh, we developed the portfolio back on October 15th, and today is November 30th, uh, which is the day where we finalized the concept scope. So you can see there's a there's a slide just on scope. That's kind of the, that's the finalized scope we've landed on. Um, at this point, it's with headquarters, Caltrans headquarters in Sacramento. They have to accept it by the end of the year. And then we just, and then we start the design process early next year um, to complete the designs in April. So we'll be coming back between, uh, sorry, in March. So we, we'll be coming back between January and March to let you guys know, hey, here's designs we're considering and get your feedback on how these beautification measures are actually going to look. Um, so we're really excited for that as we move down the road. And um, yeah, as you can see there, June 30th, 2023, we are, we are required to have all uh, elements constructed by then. So uh, looking forward to the fast timeline there and hoping to see some improvements in the near term as opposed to the far term. Uh, and that's, that's the conclusion of my presentation. Um, I can take Any questions? Yes, sir. In the future, well, I belong to a little neighborhood called the Logan neighborhood just across the street from here. Okay? The original freeway took a lot of houses on the most part of the neighborhood okay, along the railroad track. Then the second, the second problem was when there was an expansion, okay, it went again south, we lost more houses. The houses to the north never lost a house. So, what I'm hearing, or question is, do you guys have any plans to further widen the five freeway along here the railroad track in the future? And if you do, are you still going to fix more houses on this old neighborhood? That's the first point that I have many of you. To move what you see in the street right in front of here, where the city did that with the Santa Boulevard, they went south, I mean north, which took that's kind of been sweet, we will be home to do it again. So we're always worried about what's going on. I will build more houses. Okay. My mom, when she was young, right where you have the bridge over the freeway, she was living there, she had to move. Okay. So we've lost a lot. We certainly don't want to lose anyone. Some of our families have been there since the 1900s. My dad, 1912, he's been the neighborhood. So we're hoping if there's ever expansion, go to south, please. So in the south part this way, or that one, or north that way. Okay, so that, that is my for the future. Yeah, I know. I'm glad you mentioned this. The, the impacts uh, for expansion are well, I mean, are well documented, right? Um, uh, but, but I will reassure you, these beautification investments we're talking about right now will not expand the right-of-way footprint of Caltrans in any way, shape, or form. Thank you. Um, I'm really glad that um, parking lot there at the zoo, close to what's called the Caltrans uh, work program parking lot, is finally going to get enhanced. So actually that's a gateway to the city, and the zoo now is having a, it's going to have a beautiful entrance as they're working on it. Um, and it's, it's high time that we, the Caltrans and the city, um, get this done. Also, um, I like to see some trees in the parking lot, some wall trees. Possible. There's a, uh, just a lot of asphalt um, doesn't look good. And we're a tree city, we always learn more trees. Um, does the mayor have anything to say, lady uh, councilwoman Lopez? Yes. Uh, yes. I'll give you an opportunity now. But, you know, thank you for your work in getting this, you know, um, on board with Caltrans. Appreciate that to follow up. Anybody else want to say anything on the subject? Appreciate it. Thanks for coming down. Yeah. And we'll be in touch. Thank you. Uh, are we having any uh, members participate? Yes. Any questions there? Any? There was one question regarding or asking to repeat the questions from the audience that can I show that into the chat? Okay. One of the questions from um, the Logan neighborhood, Mr. Sal Romero. Sal Romero, long time resident of, of the neighborhood. Why did you know if there's going to be any freeway expansion in that neighborhood that was going to take additional properties? And I believe the answer was no. So that was the question that was answered. Thank you. Okay. So 
So now I want to next thing just to move this along. Um, let me see. I will go now to my next topic. Hold on. Back. If I don't, can, can you reach that paper for me, please? Kaminsky. Oh, there we go. I got names over here. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Do we want to do a public works thing? Okay, so from public works, we have here. Uh, my glasses are over there. I have been, um, um, introduced the public works members, and you're going to be speaking about street night. Street night, and also um, in the neighborhood that Saddleback has requested, because we do have some dark streets. And we, uh, for example, on Linwood Avenue, we have one light on each block. It's great for Halloween. If you want to have Halloween, party, you know, decorations is amazing. Um, scare a lot of kids and like that. We do need some lighting, and and councilwoman. Uh, Lopez has been uh, requesting this from the, from the neighborhood request on our behalf, and hopefully we'll see some of your thoughts soon. Yes. Right. Good evening, everyone. Uh, once again, my name is Zephyr Kulam. Um, someone is passing out these little exhibits for you guys, so please make sure you get one. I'm going to be talking about this uh, briefly here. Um, our department took over streetlights uh, January of this year, so we've been kind of figuring out and learning as we go. Uh, ever since we started, we started getting requests. What type of requests have we been getting since we're in charge of street lights now is we need more street lights. There's not enough lights. So one of the things that we realized is as we've been getting these requests, we've been compiling a list of locations to have projects that we could identify when future funding becomes available. Like uh, Desi Ray has mentioned, Councilmember Lopez in the neighborhood reached out to us to identify some areas in Saddleback. And to be honest with you, the timing was great because one of the things that we realized, we've been receiving a request here, a request there. So we thought, you know what? Instead of just looking at one block here, one block there, let's try to look at a whole neighborhood and see what's needed in the whole neighborhood. I don't want to be piecemealing things. It didn't, it didn't make sense to me. So we picked a couple of neighborhoods, and actually Saddleback was one of the ones that we're piloting right now. So what we ended up doing is we have a gentleman that actually comes into work at 3 o'clock in the morning. Um, what he does, he's in charge of our streetlights, and he drives around typically a couple of hours in the morning just to see if there's any streetlights out. We get a lot of concerns about this light isn't turning on, this light is on all the time, it flickers. And the only way we could check those is at night. So that's what this gentleman does for us. When we received the request for Saddleback, we actually had the gentleman drive the, uh, the streets in Saddleback. And Desi, you said it. The streets you identified, if you guys look at this uh, little map here, the areas that are highlighted in pink are the areas that we, we confirm. There's need for more lighting. There's no doubt about it. There's also some dots, some black dots on the map that are very tentative where street lights could be placed. So this is a preliminary assessment. So I don't want anyone thinking, hey, we got money for this, this is moving forward right now. We just wanna make sure that's clear. We're doing a preliminary assessment, but what we want to get to is to take this information, to develop some plans so that again, like I said earlier, when funding becomes available, you know what? We got a project here, let's fund it. So that's where we're at. And in terms of funding, I know that's one of the questions. Unfortunately, we do not have a dedicated funding source for streetlights. Our budget is for maintenance, and the maintenance money we have for this year, we may not have enough money by the end of our fiscal year, which ends in June, to replace some streetlights if they get knocked down. Believe it or not, we get knocked down three, four a month, and those things are about $10,000 to replace. So the budget we have is very limited. However, our department is really good at applying for grants. And we're doing this because one of the things that I know we have coming up next year, we have what we call the ATP cycles, the ATP grants. Those are for active transportation projects. The city has been extremely successful obtaining these grants in the past. And uh, last year, we actually applied for the uh, Advanced Learning Center. We applied for a grant there. We didn't receive the money, but since we took over the streetlights, we want to repackage that application 
and submit that for grant funding next year. So we'll see what happens, but that's something that I want to just kind of share with you guys and let you know. So the, the question I've had before is what are the streetlights going to look like? So if you guys go on and drive on Grand between 1st and 4th, it's the concrete type of lights uh, that are typically installed. That's our city standard, and that's what we're, uh, if we get funding, that's what we'll be installing in the neighborhood. But I'm glad you guys brought this to our attention. This is one of the uh, locations that we want to prioritize. Uh, I know the lighting is, is important out there. Uh, I'm actually going to drive it right now after the meeting because I personally haven't been out there uh, at night. I've been out there during the day, and you guys do have some challenges out there because of the trees. So trees and lights are a challenge. You know, the trees block the light, and no one wants to re remove a tree. Like you said, David, we're a tree city. So we have to be very strategic in where we place these lights. So uh, that's what I want to let you guys know. That's where we're at right now. We have an assessment. We want to continue processing this to develop some preliminary plans so that when the grant funding does become available or if there's any kind of funding available, we'll have these projects ready for uh, funding. So it, with that, if you guys have any questions. You know what? That, repeat the question. So the, the question was, what are the chances of those funding uh, or the funding becoming available? It's a competitive grant. So um, there's literally hundreds of cities applying for these grants. We have been one of the most successful cities in the state. Uh, personally, we, we submitted 22 grants last time. No other agency in terms of staffing has submitted so many. So we're extremely aggressive. Um, I would say we have a good chance, but there's no guarantee. Like I said, it's competitive. We are very aggressive. There's no doubt about it. Uh, we've re Last year was our worst year. We only got one. Can you repeat the question? Uh, the question was of the 22 that we submitted, how many got funded? And I said one. We missed it by literally a point or two on about three or four other applications, so we were close. So what happens, these applications, they give you a score and they have a cutoff. And they cut it off depending upon how, many, how much money they have available. The good thing is, next year, my understanding is they have the regular pot of money, but they had some extra money from two years, or I guess from last year, so they're going to increase the pot next year. So the chances would be a little bit better. So that's why we want to make sure that we're aggressive and pursue these uh, grant applications opportunities because that's how we fund these type of projects. Any other questions? I have some. Sure. Does anybody, does anybody have questions on, on the Zoom? No questions. No questions on the Zoom. My, okay, so my question is, would you be, these, when they go on, would it be underground utilities or overhead? Wires. Uh, I mentioned that street lights and trees don't like each other. Overhead wiring through trees is a problem. Yeah. So we do try to go underground. Uh, that's what we're trying to do because at least if it's windy, it's got an winds. Um, this, uh, last week we had a lot of issues because of the winds. A lot of tree branches on the street, on the ground. It impacts the street lighting as well. Uh, when the trees are moving, they break the cables or the wires, and then we lose the power. So we, we try to go with underground. So so the current the current um, lights that we have there, um, they'll have wires running from utility poles behind the homeowner's um, yards, which don't intercept the trees because they're coming from the backyards to the utility poles. So when this happens, are the existing poles going to be also uh, underground at that time, or really that wire that serves in that light pole? The, the goal will be if it's in between the run, if it's a mid block pole, and I don't know what you're talking about, if it's feeding from the back, we would actually replace that pole, and that cable or the wire would be removed. We're, we're trying to beautify it as well. Yeah. Now, how about the, this, this federal infrastructure fund that we just approved? Is that going to be help? Hopefully, you know, funds quicker. If funding becomes available, we will be applying. And I know you guys do get um, apply for a lot of grants that are very successful for many projects in the city. Okay, uh, you think I'm going to move on to any, any questions? I'm going to move on to the next topic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mayor, Councilman, you want to say anything on this topic? You live in the neighborhood. <laughs> Thank you. You always had a great way of introducing us. Thank you for the introduction. I'm just kidding. 
Why, why aren't, I wanted to know, why aren't we at the school any longer? I know we used to meet at the school, which was a little bit more convenient for everybody, so we need to probably sit down and speak with our uh, friends over at the district. I know that they be, they were happy to have us all those years. I'm sure we'll be happy to be there again. It's a little bit more convenient. I, I certainly um, know that this is a little bit further away from us. So um, I'm Vicente Sarmiento, uh, Mayor uh, here in Santana, and your neighbor. Um, is everybody okay in English or necesitan que hablen español? Que I know in the past I've gone back and forth, so um, you tell me, is everybody, does, do we have a translation? She's translating. Okay, you're translating? Okay, good. I just want to make sure that everybody is able to understand. So, so there's a number of things on this agenda, and I, that's why I didn't want to jump in on one, because we're going to be talking, we could be talking all night if that happens. So I'd rather just, you know, let you know that I'm here with uh, Council Member Lopez, who so I'm going to go ahead and uh, introduce him you know, just after this. But I really wanted to thank you for coming, because like I said, I know, we know it's out of our neighborhood, and it took us a little bit further to, to be out here. But, um, but I did want to thank the staff that's here with us. So our Director of Building and Planning is here. Uh, we have people from the City Attorney's Office. We have our Code Enforcement represented, our uh, Police Department represented, um, our Quality of Life team that deals with transient and people who are experiencing homelessness, um, and Public Works, obviously. So we have almost every department in the city represented here because we know uh, we've got a lot of good things to talk about tonight, you know, with respect to the lights, with respect to the um, new uh, uh, Amazon effort, the economic development um, going on at the old register site. But um, we also have some issues that are challenging, right, that are challenging our neighborhood um, with respect to um, some of the impacts that we've received recently. And, um, you know, for me, uh, I've lived uh, at, the, at the house I'm living at now for about 16 years, but I grew up in this neighborhood, and so I grew up just on the other side of Grand, right on Eastwood, um, you know, since 1965. So this neighborhood is very familiar to me, um, and I've never experienced the impacts that we're experiencing right now, so I understand, um, you know, our level of... Um, of impatience and frustration that we're going through right now. So I want us to have a really honest conversation. I think that we are um, all aware. And, you know, I, I want to thank the council member for making our staff aware because I used to represent this when I was a member of the council of this district. Um, and now uh, council member Lopez represents it. And she's done a really excellent job of making sure that your issues are presented to the rest of the council and the staff. And she's a very, very strong vocal advocate, and I'm here really to support her um, and support us, because I'm coming here not only as the mayor, but I'm coming here as your neighbor, right? And um, I've had some incidents that are, you know, I can speak from personal experience, have affected my family, right? Um, and so, you, uh, you know, we've had a couple of issues where, um, you know, my daughter was home and my home was broken into when she was there by herself. She's 16 years old, and, uh, you know, her mother and I left, and, you know, and, and you know, things happened. Luckily, you know, it, it didn't escalate to much more, but we don't want that to happen, so we want to see how we can work on some solutions. We can work on some ways to uh, navigate um, out of this. I want to thank all of you, um, you know, and, and Desi says he's a liaison. He's more than that. He's been uh, sort of the neighborhood representative um, since since I've been here, and um, and he's been a great voice for us because he, you know, he keeps all of us aware, um, especially me when there's something that's, you know, um, elevating to a point where we all need to be uh, concerned about. And I think, you know, we're very, we're very um, blessed to have him because not uh, many other neighborhoods have a person like him. Uh, we have more than 50 neighborhood associations in the city, and some of them are not as active. Some of them are more dormant. Some of them are really, really active. But Desi has always made our neighborhood a priority of his, and he goes out of his way um, to do things for us that normally we wouldn't, um, you know, we wouldn't have in other, um, in other neighborhoods. So I want to thank him personally for that, and all of you for supporting Desi, you know, as we, um, you know, as we go through this. So um, let me go ahead and turn it over to the council member, and we're going to stay here because we, like I said, we have. Uh, many departments that are here to respond to any questions that you have, but more importantly, to tell you what we're doing, right? And that's the important thing that we need to talk about, are what steps are being taken, uh, how we can uh, mitigate and, um, and 
prevent problems from happening in our neighborhood because that's really the, um, you know, sort of the, I think the, the goal of this meeting is to, you know, talk about that. So with that, let me go ahead and introduce, um, you know, your council member who represents you in Ward 3, Council Member Jesse Lopez. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Jesse Lopez. I was good to represent Ward 3 families last November in the Saddleback View neighborhood is part of Ward 3. And um, so a lot of the issues that you're seeing here today are things that I inherited and working closely with Desi and with Roya. Is Roya here tonight? Oh, okay. Um, so, you know, I met them through different various community events and meetings and they often have come to the uh, monthly community hours events that I have online and they've talked to me on several occasions about a lot of the issues that have been presented here today. And so, you know, I am working with Public Works closely um, to make sure that we do secure funding for the lighting. Um, and also, you know, addressing the homelessness issue, which is a big concern. Every time I drive to work, I live right around the corner from Saddleback View, and so I see the problems on an everyday basis as well. Um, and so I'm really excited to be here tonight. We have a lot of people from the city, um, the Public Works Department, we have code enforcement, planning, um, officers from the Quality of Life team, and so it's gonna be a really great opportunity for everyone to ask their questions and have them be addressed, um, and really for us to let you know um, what is the goal on our end and what are the next steps moving forward for all of us. So again, thank you for being here tonight, um, and I'm gonna hand it over to Desi to introduce our planning director. Thank you very much, thank you very much. Do you know how many people we have on Zoom? Signed in. Great, that's awesome. Thank you very much. So I'm going to go to the next drawing before we go to the next speaker. Um, so can I have you, please? Just don't pick yours. <laughs> awesome, thank you. Three one eight. Next one. All right. Who is it? Do we have one? You do? Okay, must be you then. 318. Oh, okay. Awesome. There you go. Congratulations. Thank you. Okay, great. So uh, we will move on to the next topic in our, our Public Works May. Please, thank you, thank you, thank you. So he's gonna to talk to us about the Amazon project, uh, give us an update. A lot of neighbors have been going with one around, Amazon's not coming anymore. You know, what's happening to my wall, <laughs> the trees, all that kind of stuff. So hopefully you can give us an update on that. Thank you. Thank you, Desi, and good evening, everyone. Uh, you have a great representative in Desi. I remember when I first came to the city about three and a half years ago, I didn't know Desi from, you know, the rest of our community. He walked up to me and made me feel very welcome. Not only he made me feel welcome, but he started talking about what we can do together in the future. And he's been a great representative, keeping close contact um, and talking about different projects. So Desi, thank you for doing that. Um, the Amazon project is a um, project that is uh, called reuse of the old former Orange County Register site. Um, the project is considered or called by Amazon a last mile project. And what that is, is that it's a facility that provides distribution for the what they call the last mile. So basically it's for one day delivery. When you order one day, that's most likely that's where your product is coming from. So they have a very small region that they serve and these facilities, uh, we actually have two in our city, and one is located at the former Orange County Register site. It's going to be about 112,000 square feet. It's going to remove the existing warehouse building, the parking structure on the site, and reconstruct that with uh, a warehouse development, as well as a parking lot with landscape improvements and lighting uh, for their vans pickup, as well as for delivery. Um, 
in terms of, I know there's been a lot of questions about whether or not they're coming or not. Are they, you know, looking elsewhere? Um, we've been working very closely with the developer to make sure that we facilitate uh, the plan review process and ask them whether or not they are progressing towards construction and development. They don't have an exact timeline when they can start, but they believe they can start breaking grounds in the beginning of 2022. They said first quarter, which is anywhere between January and, and March. Uh, so that's when we would expect to break ground. Um, as part of that process, they, as well as uh, staff, has been ensuring that they are committed to reaching out to the neighborhood to share with the neighborhood their plans, their construction uh, activities, as well as a contact person on site doing construction so that if there are issues that uh, you are unable to reach staff on, Desi can call me anytime, but if there are issues that needs to be addressed right away, the neighborhood will have a contact person on site so that those concerns can be voiced and can be addressed immediately. Uh, they will do that prior to const uh, construction through a written document. So uh, it, it's basically a letter and that will be helpful for, and hopefully you can keep that as reference. Um, with the construction process, they're looking at about a year and a half or so, um, or you know, 12 to, to 18 months. Uh, they're projecting right now that they will be opening sometime in mid 2023. So um, once they're open and operational, um, they will also be committing to providing the neighborhood with a contact person on site so that operationally, if there are any issues, the neighborhood can also reach them as well. So those are very, uh, those two were very uh, strong issues that we wanna make sure that Amazon understood that those things need to occur. Um, I know we've been addressing the landscape area uh, initially, they were going to build a wall right up to the property line. Uh, through working with Desi and raising concerns, our council uh, woman, Jesse Lopez, also made sure that we on staff stay on that issue. And we've worked with Amazon to maintain the landscape planter that is there now. It's 10 feet, it will be reduced by two feet so that they can also have a landscape planter on their side of the wall uh, so that the wall will be green on both sides. Uh, but on this side of our neighborhood, it will be eight feet wide uh, and it will be planted. And did you get my slide? I can kind of quickly show. So this is a concept, uh, a concept slide that they have shared with me. Uh, there'll be a 10 foot tall wall as, as promised by them. Uh, the wall will have landscaping. And the planter will have trees as well as lighting. We ensure that lighting is going to be there because we do understand that we want to make sure security lighting is available. So that is something that's going to be a part of this project. So this is what they have shared with me, and I'm currently working with them to finalize the actual site design and the planting of trees. But conceptually, this is what it's going to look like with an eight-foot wide planter. The best thing is that at the end of the day, they estimate there will be more than over 500 jobs that will be available. Um, and they have committed to working with our resource center to market those jobs locally to our residents. So overall, as the mayor has said, this is an economic development, a reuse of the site, and with the commitment of the developer as well as the operator uh, to work with the neighbor to address any issues that could be uh, created from the process of construction and operations. So hopefully uh, that will help to reassure you that the project is still coming, and you know you'll have an opportunity to learn more about the project as we move forward. So, thank you. Thank you, David. Um, any questions? Ian, yeah. yes. Uh, I'm sorry to see the register vacated it because I'm a long-term register fan and takes forward, takes the point. But I'm glad it's being developed and that being torn down an icon, the original building that used to be there before they made it what it is. So I, I'm glad that they're doing something. Because I'm just right behind there near Debbie. So I'm glad we're seeing some action there. Thank you. So, uh, thank you, Ian. Thank you. you know, thanks for doing your job and doing a very good job and, and getting it developed. Because it, it, it's, uh, it's not very good an icon, it's just an empty. And unfortunately, we're going to see some action. 
So very briefly to all of them, Ian and our neighborhood is very um, I'm glad to see this um, uh, Amazon project coming into the neighborhood. I'll keep it short. Anybody else? Martin? Always asking me. <laughs> What's going on? What's I'm coming in? All that kind of stuff. Okay. Um, so I'm glad to see the landscaping on the clay um, being developed like we talked about. And I believe I saw some ivy there on the wall, right? To help with the graffiti. Yeah, the ivy on the wall to help with the graffiti because it becomes a canvas and, you know, get graffiti. So that, that would avoid that. You know where it's on the clay, right? Okay. You like that? I think that's a, that's a great thing. I was just, uh, you know, they had this big grandiose plan a few years ago where it was to become the tallest, the tallest building in the county. But right. I don't know whatever happened to that. But this sounds, uh, sounds a little more workable. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Yes, back there. Neighborhood Park, when the freeway was expanded, about a one-mile acre, 
It's a passive part. A lot of families use it. We just recently got lighting, which is the neighborhood's right next to it. Neighbor right next to that uh, part. There's a couple here. They've seen quite an improvement since the light came in in terms of not literally transients being there at night. Um, the neighborhood has been improving. I mean, we're close to downtown. I walk downtown all the way to Ross Street now just to do some exercise. I feel safer, uh, but I always go with somebody, somebody else. Um, but recently, you know, we had this clinic move in that is um, giving out syringes. Um, and then we also have Michael's Way, which has been there for a long time, for longer than, than this other clinic on 4th Street. Uh, and we have a representative here from Michael's Way, which I'll have him make some comments and really get you here soon so we can have a dialogue. Um, he's been very, I, I donated his stuff to, to, to uh, uh, Michael's Way. But recently, I mean, especially from 4th Street, 4th Street is becoming the skid road of Santa Ana between Grand and the 55 freeway. We have a lot of good development coming in, and hopefully I'll clean it up as more lighting come, comes in. Uh, you know, you'll have more people walking, calling the cops, so we hope that that will improve. We have the Santa Ana Zoo, um, you know, getting improved. So there's a lot of, we have a new jack in the box by the DMV, which we used to be a big thing long. Now it's, it's an area that lit, you know, has light, but we still have a lot of transients coming through White Street, White Street to 4th Street. And I was out there this weekend with another resident collecting signatures. And we collected over 200 signatures about the transient issues that they're having. And this has caused many other residents, including myself, to install cameras. Okay, which I've never, I personally have never had any issue yet, yet. But many, many of the neighbors have had cars broken into. Just last week, one neighbor in the middle of the day had a car stolen by a transit in his park, in his parking lot on on on, uh, on Linwood Street in the middle of the day. Uh, the mayor has been affected, as he just said, and we've had cars broken into, people coming into the backyards, uh, front yards, washing themselves off, going up on the road. Uh, Stealing water. We have a neighbor on Wright Street that she had to put a lock on her faucet. So, this trash is done. And it's on and on and on. The quality of life has been impacted in the neighborhood. So, I'm glad that the um, staff is here, police, Kamitsky, um, hopefully, will be working with us on this. And we just have a really good neighborhood that we don't want it to go. We're having some people that are moving out. Luckily, you know, I'm a real estate. Luckily, we're in the solar market and real estate's going up, you know, because there, there's nothing else to buy. But when the market takes a turn, as people move out, we'll be impacted. Because there will be a lot of supply. No, there's a lot of supply, and, and people are going to go somewhere else find properties if they see that this area is impacted by um, the transits. So, I think that's it enough on this issue. And I'll, I'll, I'll just let um, um, the staff board, I don't know who wants to talk to um, Kaminsky, Officer Kaminsky, go ahead and introduce yourself. And um, if you, I do want to finish the meeting on time to be heard over in some of tonight. We have a half an hour, and we want to be, I want this to be a dialogue. Um, between the neighbors, Mike is way that's here. Thank you very much again, and, and staff. And obviously, we're civilized, and we can have a nice dialogue. And just uh, you know, the letter that we sent out, the mayor has one, council member has one, and like I said, over 200 people signed this petition, which is over two thirds of the residents are neighborhood. Thank you. So, can you guys hear me? I got a big mouth. Is that all right? Okay. Otherwise, it reverberates, and then I can't talk. Can, can the Zoom people appear? Yes. Okay. So my name is Ken Gaminski. I worked for the police department for 34 years. 
I've retired, and now I've come back and I'm working out of the city manager's office and I'm assigned to deal with and coordinate city responses for the homeless problem, okay? I'd like to start by talking about what the city has done and what the commitment, this is gonna fall, and what the commitment from the city has been. So when nobody else in the county wanted to put up shelters, the city put up a shelter. We built a 200, 250 bed shelter down off of Dyer. We called it the Lick. We built it in 30 days. It was a, a non-permanent site. And we put homeless people who wanted services there. The key to getting people off of the streets is to get them to accept services generally put them into some type of shelter or permanent supportive housing that wrap around services and reintegrate these people. With that being said, we lost our lease, we'll say, on Carnegie, which meant that we had to close that shelter. When we closed that shelter, we then entered into an agreement with another shelter out of the city, as well as reopened the Salvation Army Hospitality House. So even though we don't have a shelter that we have in the city now today, owned and operated by the city, we have over 200 beds that we pay for, that you pay for. <clears throat> I have 50 beds for homeless individuals now available. The Colt team will come over and talk to you a little while later about their actions. But in essence, the Colt team City net outreach individuals from the city contact homeless residents every day. And they have been outreached, they have been offered home, they've been offered shelter. And the population that remains <clears throat> is very service resistant. It's very service resistant. There is a tremendous amount of mental health concerns and issues as well as substance abuse issues. I think when you guys drive up and down First Street, when you look on some of the side streets, even in your neighborhood, you have personally witnessed what substance abuse looks like. You've seen the open air narcotics use. You've seen people naked and running around in the streets. You've seen what mental health issues are. I tell you that because what we have left in this city as far as a homeless population is the hardest of the hard to deal with. People that want shelter are in shelter. On this day, right here, right now, if somebody wants to go to a shelter, we have beds. Council has authorized that we enact our own or build our own new shelter that will be city owned and operated that one will actually open in uh, January, mid-January. It has a, a capacity of 200 beds that is expandable to over 313. So the idea that the city of Santa Ana will be in a position to offer services and shelter to those people in need, the city council has met that burden. What you guys wanna talk about is the problems that are in your neighborhood of the service resistant population that we have. Right now, the police department responds to roughly 140,000 calls for service a year. At least 15 to 20% of those calls are involving transient related issues. So you're talking anywhere between 20 and 30,000 calls for service a year are specifically transient related. With the idea that police officers should be doing police work and not acting as social workers, the city council entered into an agreement with a group called CityNet. CityNet has a program that has been in effect for about a year in Anaheim. Instead of having, well, let's go back. When a resident calls the police department or city net directly, instead of launching police resources out to that person who's hanging out at the bus bench, loitering on the corner, instead, 
we will be launching CityNet trauma-informed specialists who do nothing but engage with this population. In order to get a service-resistant homeless person off of the street, it can take 10, 15, or 20 contacts by that specialist in order for these people to take the step to go to shelter or to take the step towards some form of permanent supportive housing. With that being said, we're going to take the burden off of the police department and we're going to give that to CityNet. But that means the police department's going to have more time to deal with police-related matters. And a majority of your complaints are police-related matters. They are people trespassing on your property. They are people urinating and exposing themselves in public. Open-air narcotics use, drinking. The quality of life-related issues and concerns will now be, we are now as a city in a better position to address those. Now we have Commander Marty from the Santa Ana Police Department and Sergeant Juan Montiel from the Quality of Life team. Commander Marty, you want to come up and talk to them about what the police department's going to be doing and what you have been doing? Good evening, everybody. My name is uh, Commander Joseph Marty, and uh, just a little bit about me. I've been with the city of Santa Ana, Santa Ana Police Department since 2004, and I lateral from the outside agency. So it's my privilege to be serving you residents here um, since 2004. It's been a wonderful time and a, a great community. Uh, I'm in charge of our operations division, which we have five different enforcement teams uh, that have five different missions. And I'm going to we're going to focus more on Colt, which is our quality of life team, because that team is the one that specializes on the outreach as well as enforcement dealing with the homeless population, um, like Ken Kaminsky just talked about. Uh, another team that I supervise is our directed enforcement team. That deals with any type of special problems that need long-term solutions, right? Something beyond uh, what this team deals with is things that uh, are beyond a calls for service, right? Patrol deals with calls for service. This 10 officer directed team comes in and I allocate the team to deal with these different special problems through the high crime areas. And so um, we have Probably, let me see here. I started back in January in this division, and this active team has been through your corridor, the first street and the fourth street uh, corridor very frequently, so we're very aware. Uh, just today, uh, the team making their normal rounds to the first street and the fourth street corridor, we made 10 arrests today. With the, the subjects that Ken Gamissi just talked about, the people that are refusing the services. Um, I can assure you that this 10 officer team, as well as our Colt team, will be uh, diligently putting a lot more uh, short-term problem solution in terms of our, our presence. We're gonna pick up our presence through these corridors because what our job is to make sure that your quality of life is peaceful and, and these issues that you're having, that we rid them immediately. Um, I'm gonna have our Colt Sergeant come up uh, right now, which is Sergeant Juan Montiel, and he's gonna talk about just a little bit about what they do and what his experience is. He's an expert. Uh, next to Ken Gaminsky when it comes to dealing with the, the people that want services and the people that don't want the services. So this is Sergeant Juan Montiel. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, yeah, my, my name's Juan Montiel. Um, I've been with the city of Santa Ana since the police department since 1996. So I've been here a while. A um, little, little bit of background on me with the high school in Santa Ana, married a Santa Ana girl. My, I got family from, from uh, Logan from Delhi, my uh, father-in-law on the wall of the vet, and my grandfather-in-law over there at uh, next to Logan Park. So Santa Anita. So I, I, I got a, a, a connection with Santa Ana, you know, uh, that, that's probably not common with, with a lot of people. But I've been assigned to working homeless in the city with my good way out in the Civic Center and stuff like that since 2016. So I've seen the homeless problem explode. I was in charge of the Civic Center for three, four years when there was, when I got there, it was seven, eight hundred homeless individuals moving in the Civic Center. We were able to vacate 
the homeless problem in the civic center without one arrest, one use of force, finding them all some type of, if they wanted some type of service, some type of housing, some type of program or something like that. But in the last couple of years, this homeless problem has exploded throughout throughout the city. There's a gamut of reasons why we can get into it. I mean, it's just, nothing's going to change. Laws have changed. You know, 15 years ago when I was a street cop, you got busted with narcotics. You went to state prison and you went to program. You were forced to go to rehab. Or if not, you went to jail. Now you will be fined more for red light violations than you will be in possession of narcotics. It's out of control. There's no mental health bed for these individuals. Someone from the hospital, you put them in the hospital for mental health home. They're out before you even write the report on it because the, the, the doctors hand them prescriptions, tell them to walk out and take care of themselves. Well, first you have a mental health doctor so that you don't have to fill the prescription. If you have a bottle, you can either use it or sell it on the street. So back in 2018, the city created a quality of life team. They said, okay, you know, service center issue's been dealt with. Now we have to go address this whole citywide problem. So we, we created basically an interdepartmental team involving the police department, public works, parks and rec, code enforcement. And we said, okay, we're going to see care of it. And we're just going to hit encampments throughout the city. Because you guys know that places like Angels Park and Logan Park and, and, and Delphi down south and you know, now Cesar Chavez or Gold Camp Casino Park. Everywhere you saw campus, you saw tents, you saw all this kind of stuff. But the, the, the issue back in the old days was that you sent an officer in the office to send them away, but the encampment's still sitting there, the guy comes back to the encampment. Well, now we have teams that basically public work, city crews, code enforcement, they're right around the house. And we have city net, a nonprofit that rides around with us, we have the Orange County Health Station, and we just go out. So now these guys have an option. You can go get help, or you can be cited for a violation of camping or storage or something else in the city or rent for that time. And once we remove that individual from their encampment, whether it's to go to shelter, whether it's to go somewhere else, we also clean up that mess that they created in it. Um, Logan, Saddleback, yeah, I, I live just north of the border. I'm, I'm, I'm so pretty much Logan Orange. I drive through here, my kids go to my day, so I drive through your neighbors every day. So you guys actually get a little bit of extra love from the cult food because my kids are starting to name the homeless and give me a nickname when I drive to school. So if they give them a nickname, it's like I can remember. They're just homeless, homeless to leave. What the state, what, so we've been doing this, I think, so far this year. We've housed and some are repeated. Four to five hundred individuals throughout the city. But an example today, we, we housed a guy, uh, I'll tell you his name, Mark Obama, from uh, El Sal area. He has been homeless since 2008. I've known him since 2016. And we finally got him in a shelter in 2021. And this is what, this is sometimes this is what it takes to get these individuals into homelessness. But the problem is, and I'm, is, is that takes a lot of officer time. When I could be going out up and down First Street, Wright Street, 4th Street, and dealing with these narcotic violations, these guys gambling in the streets, these guys urinating in the concrete and stuff like that. I'm sitting out in an encampment, talking with individuals for five years on and off, and getting into the shelter. So the city invested $1.3 million in a seven-month contract to try to withdraw the officers from doing that and have bring city net, bring professionals that know how to do outreach into that. So that the 10-man team that I supervise can now start going and dealing with that problem that's been brewing and building up in first years, which have overflowed into your neighborhoods through White Street and through Paw and through all those other streets that are going on there. That program actually launches tomorrow. So as that program progresses and builds itself, I'm freeing my officers from spending five years talking to a guy in the shelter to now going down and dealing with these actual quality life issues that you guys have in Valley. And so it's, 
There's a lie at the end of the tunnel for Sal. There's a lie at the end of the tunnel for me, he says. Believe it or not, I got a little bit blocked there. When I got signed to homelessness back in 2016, I got it. Yeah. No. Exactly. 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 Yeah. Like, <laughs> but so there's a lot of the end of the tunnel for thousands, not just thousands, but all these neighborhoods. Del High Street and Packers, I went to one of the all these neighborhoods get attacked. So what happens in an area like uh, Lincoln and 17th, where you know, don't have nothing, and that's fenced around there, the guys are out there, and I see these guys out, so many times come clean up. Next day, guys are back, the bikes are back, the ships are back. So, <laughs> and, and so that's, and so that's, can you repeat the question so that people can kind of yeah. shorten that story? Sure. Yeah. So they ask the question, they use an example of what's going on at the hometown buffet at 17th and Lincoln. When hometown buffet closed, they left safety and empty lot. And they were all hanging out underneath the awning and the benches. Yes. Well, me and my Colt guys were out there all the time. <coughs> this is where the part of the Colt aspect was. What did we do is we reached out to code enforcement. And we said, hey, this enforcement that we're taking and arresting the site, it's not working. We have to now address the problem here. Because of, this was even before COVID. Most yeah. hometown. But now, because of COVID, we have all these vacant businesses, and property owners are refusing to maintain the property because they're not being occupied no more. Well, that's a haven for homeless people, right? So we forced through code enforcement to get them to fence up the property. Now, obviously, it forced it now it's the right away. But now that they're on public property, my team can go out and enforce it. So you'll see, they're either getting in a van that says in, or they're getting in a police car that says in a police, and they're going. The problem is, and I'm not making excuses, is as soon as we take that guy to jail, by the time we finish that citation, he's locked out of jail. He goes to court, if he goes to court, or he goes to war, it's six months, nine months. We take him to jail, he spends the night in jail. The judge says, okay, you're homeless, you have that, you're out. The system's broken. We're, we're working in a system that's broken, but we still have to solve the problem. It doesn't matter. You know what I mean? So, for, for like I was saying, for Saddleback, for all these neighborhoods in, in, in the center. I'm gonna be able to, we're gonna be able to refocus police attention to do the guys that are out there smoking the pipes and using the needles in your neighborhoods and in your parks. You know what I mean? We're gonna be able to get the guys that are drinking, the guys that are gambling, the guys that are just loitering. Let the experts do what they do. Take police for the most part. They're still called the police are not responsible. But for the most part, if first street's a mess, I got 10 officers out there, we're not leaving first street until First Street is cleared up. And while we're in First Street, we're identifying certain businesses, whether it's motels and stuff, to target the code enforcement. We get them to clean up their property so they're not such an attractive nuisance to the homeless people. So you guys have two problem locations you really wanted to talk about tonight, right? So we have a representative from Mike is White, and this is probably a good time to constructively Tell me what some of your concerns are with Micah's Way. I'm going to be meeting with the representative from Micah's Way later this week, and we're going to have a discussion about what your concerns are and some concerns that I've seen as I've sat in your neighborhood, watched activity, monitored what's going on. So in, in transparency, what are some of your issues so that the representative from Micah's Way can hear and then and then we will try to work through some of those problems to create a better relationship. Yes, sir. Well, first of all, I mean, homelessness is a very complicated issue. Yes, sir. There's a lot of moving parts, and there is no one simple solution for anybody. I Agreed. Mean, it just, um, when we were talking about uh, uh, service resistant individuals, mm -hmm. and you look at the two um, establishments along 4th Street, it really raises the question, um, are these institutions helping the problem or are they enabling it? Are they allowing this to perpetrate, you know, are they allowing these individuals to further resist resistance? Mm -hmm. um, and we it raises the question, is, are those two uh, establishments directly feeding the problem on first year? So, uh, I will talk to Mike's wife about that specific concept that you're talking about. Can I ask that 
Hold, hold, let, me, let me go one second. Okay. However, I will tell you that I believe the two are dramatically different. Okay? Just in my experience in dealing with nonprofits. One appears to be a for profit institution that is utilizing drug addiction to make money. The other one is a nonprofit who has a long term investment in the city and in the homeless population. And what they specialize in is working with the service resistant population. A majority of the services that I offer in shelters, I have to get you into a shelter to have services. Uh, another example is our, our um, what are they called? The uh, city net crews will go out and offer services. However, in my opinion, in this world, there are places that are needed for a service resistant population. I would agree with you. Is it the best place for that to be? I don't know. But I agree that there is a need for it, whether or not, whether, hello? Hello? Whether or not it's in that spot, that's open for interpretation. So we'll have that discussion, okay? Yes, sir. My issue with, with the, the homeless, or however they're characterized, it's not a night time, it's not a day time, it's around the clock time. It's at all. It is. And, mm -hmm. and that's what I'm just trying to. I live right behind the mayor, three doors down from the mayor's home. Okay. My husband burglarized by the homeless. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I open up my garage, a garage door, and, and tools are missing. You know, I, I open up the trunk of of my car, take the groceries out, homeless goes in there to help themselves. They're out, and I work late at night, you know, in my living room, AutoCAD, and I do my designs and all that. I gotta keep my front door locked because the homeless are up, they're walking up down the street all night long, two, three o'clock in the morning. It's an all night, all day, all evening problem. It's systemic in the side of that area. And and I asked one homeless, I challenged him. He says it's safer for us to walk at night because we're preyed upon by other homeless people. That's what one homeless person mentioned, mentioned to me. And I go, you can meet these, you have people preying on you within the homeless encampments? Absolutely. And I said, we walk around, it's not to get our exercise, we feel safer at night. And that. And I was just like, you know, even the homeless have problems within their encampment issues. So Correct. It's an on, right? And you're more familiar Correct. than I am probably. But these are some of the issues we're facing in the neighborhood where I live at. There's no thoroughfare traffic. So I know who's in the neighborhood. Who be in the neighborhood. Okay. So let me ask you this, and I ask you to raise your hand. How many of you are frustrated with the police response in your neighborhood? Go ahead. Go ahead. It should be everybody, right? Right? I've been doing this long enough. It should be everybody, right? Okay. <laughs> This is what I'd like to say. We have a new program that's starting tomorrow that it is my hope we're going to free up some more police resources. I want you to, I want you to fight it in your hearts to get the police department another chance, okay? And I've said this before and I'll say it again and some of you are gonna go blah, blah, blah. I want you to call the cops. I want you to call the cops. I want you to call the cops. And I want you to do that because I want to drive police resources to your neighborhood. I want to drive police resources to your neighborhood during the day. I want to drive police resources to your neighborhood at night. I want to drive police resources to when you say activity is happening. When there's criminal activity occurring in your neighborhood. There's people here who are going to say, I call the cops but they don't come. I know I've heard that too. I'll tell you this, when I shop on Amazon, I can track my package because inside of that Amazon delivery truck, there's a little tracker. I can also tell you that inside every one of those cop cars, there's a tracker. With that being said, when cops don't go to calls for service, they get into big trouble. Now the cops may not be there when you want them there, but they'll get there eventually. My plea to you tonight is call the cops, Let's drive police resources to your neighborhood to deal with criminal activity. I promise you, 
I will sit down with the representative for Micah's Way and we will have an open discussion about some of your concerns and issues. After I've met with Micah's Way, I'll sit down with Desi and we'll see what we can do about fixing some of your concerns and issues with Micah's Way. But my biggest concern and what I'd like to spend the majority of the evening on is the overarching concerns with the business that's acting as a needle exchange. Fair enough? Okay. At this point, I'd like to call off Executive Director Min Tai, who will talk about what planning and building and code enforcement will be dealing is dealing in concert with the city attorney's office. Thank you. Um, I just want to say a few words, um, and then I'll introduce you to my uh, code enforcement manager, who is actually my boots on the ground on dealing with these issues uh, as it relates to the impact that are coming from what I would call a business under a land use issue. The issues that you're experiencing, we're very sympathetic and empathetic about what's going on. Our role in this process deals directly with a private property and a private property owner and the business operations on that property and how that business impacts adjacent properties. So we have a very limited scope on how we will be addressing this issue uh, so that we can work in tandem with our code team, with our police department, to address the ancillary, but also major issues that are coming out and stemming from the property and the business that's been approved on site. So with that, I want to introduce you to our code enforcement manager, uh, Elvo Nunez. He's been doing this for a very long time has great experience and has a really good track record of addressing land use, property maintenance issues, when the city has to go to court. And I want to assure you that the way that we approach code enforcement is that every case that we approach, we approach it as if we're going to be going to court. And what that means is that we do our due process, we do our due diligence, we ensure that I can die and our T's across so that when not if, but when we go to court, we ensure that we win that case. So with that, I'll go and discuss what we're doing at this property location. So, um, well, like my, my director said, so I can't go into details because we have started our enforcement experts, right? So to the extent that we take enforcement action, as my director said, the expectation is that there's a high probability that we'll be going to court. So we don't share that not a lot of information and the details because sometimes it might be a criminal action that the city may want to take. I can say this, both properties, that um, at least with you're in the corridor on 4th Street, the zone for professional use, that's how you see offices on, off of 4th Street. Without a specific um, zoning restriction, you have certain operational guidelines. We feel that at least one of the properties, you know, may not be complying with that as far as uh, their, the way they're operating their business, right? So, and, and I'll say it because uh, we're in the notice at least to, to make that way. So we allow for due process. And when we make due process, we inform the, the, the tenant, in this case, the property owner, you know, make that way representative here. So they're aware, I'm not sharing something that is not in a sense, confidential, right? We, we did our investigation, we reviewed the zoning requirements, and then what we do when we send a notice, as typically any type of enforcement case, we allow for a term of compliance, right? We highlight what we feel is the zoning violations, and then we we'll allow time for term process to be insured, which means if the property owner and our tenant wishes to dispute that, they have an appeal process, right? They get to request a hearing before our hearing officer, or they get to sue us, right? And so in that case, we feel we're, we're pretty confident that if the action we've taken are within our zoning guidelines. So the syringes, and I'll give a little bit more information on that, it's, it's a little bit more difficult because, and, and it's, it's a typical, and not just a big case, we did this with illegal gaming machines and the cannabis aspect. A lot of times businesses come and apply for a business license in a specific location. And so when they submit paperwork, they indicated we're going to do one thing, right? So the initial zoning review might say that this business at its address is complying with the zoning requirement. 
But if the intent is to circumvent that, obviously some folks may not be truthful. And in that case, the operation requirements or what they're actually doing activity-wise may be distinctive from the zoning requirements. That takes time for us to investigate. Uh, and a due diligence. So when we investigate, again, as my director said, our intention is to not just to uh, go to winning court, is to make sure that people are compliant, right? So if, if a business comes and says, I'm going to operate a medical office, and it's allowed in the zone, we will approve a medical office. But you have to operate at the medical office, right? If you chose to operate contrary to a traditional medical office, then we have to document this contrary to that. That takes time sometimes. And so once we get up gathering now that we feel like our evidence or conversation to take action, they will do that. So we work in collaboration with the city attorney's office so that we're confident that when we take certain actions, everybody's guaranteed to process, both the resident who complain as our client and the person we're dealing with when we issue the citation. Because I thought what we want in reality is compliance. They need to comply with the Sony requirements, make sure they're not impeding or impacting the neighbors in a negative way so that everybody's happy, both the businesses and the residents. In this case, we take an action on both properties, I can say that, and, um, and just following that, that up until it completes or get compliant, or we go to court. Okay. Thank you, Albert. Yeah, we're gonna open it to questions, comments from, from the neighborhood. I know, yes, sir. Um, one of our biggest things here that catches them too, okay, that's what catches them. that goes to them too, yes, sir. we're here in the middle right now, right? Logan's here, Mason's over, this railroad track runs all the homeless, okay? That's why we get so many homeless here, that's why they get it over on 1st Street, 4th Street, they're spread out from here. One reason being is we've been fighting this for the longest time. All the prisoners, they get out of jail, come here and get released. Where do they go? So, what, they stay in one spot. so what, what Mr. Andrade is talking about is a long-standing issue that the city, the city has to deal with. No matter what the reason, no matter where in the, in the county of Orange you get arrested, you get transported, you get transported to the Orange County Jail, and then get shipped out to various different jails, and then when you get released, you come back to the Santa Ana Jail, to the Intake Release Center, and you get released. Uh, we're actually having discussions with the county of Orange point by way of litigation that the city has engaged with to try to work with the sheriff's department to figure out what other options there are. There are, the biggest issue is this, and then I'll, I'll leave it alone, okay? You got arrested in Buena Park, but you live in Orange. So you got transported to the sheriff by the sheriff's to Santa Ana, then you got released. And now you go to the sheriff and you go, does he go back to Buena Park? Does he go back to Orange? And once he gets released, unless he wants to go, it's kidnapping and I can't move. So the concept that is out there is there should be more release centers than just the city of Santa Ana. And that's what your mayor is having discussions with, with uh, entities. I didn't want to speak more. <laughs> he covered it, uh, Joe. Yeah, Do you need more? Right? It, 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 it is. Look at it. All the way down. If you walk that railroad track, you'll see all the homes all the way down. And all the way back. And all the way to the park. So, so we have, I mean, and, and, you know, Ken is correct. Not only do we have litigation with the county, because of that issue, the release, because a lot of it could be just a site and release as well. If you're arrested in Buena Park, you should be cited and released in Buena Park, um, not taken in under the guise of being taken to jail, because we know 
that they're going to be released immediately after that, and they'll be released in our city. And so we've seen other cities that have been complicit in allowing the sheriff to, and really guiding the sheriff into arresting them, taking them into the um, into the jail that's located here in Santa Ana, and then they're released in 24 hours here in the park. And they don't go back a lot of times because there are services that are provided here um, that aren't provided in their communities. I think our position, you know, with, on the city council is we've done a lot in the city because we understand um, nobody is not compassionate, right, with what's happening with, with folks who are on the street and experiencing homelessness. That's not the issue. But we have litigation against the county. We have litigation against Union Pacific, which operates the rail system, and that is really a, a sovereign jurisdiction. That's not city property. Uh, you know, and we have litigation against uh, mental health uh, association facility that's on South Main. So we have tried to litigate this as much as we could to try to solve it. And these are based on land use issues. They aren't late, based upon the homeless are bad or let's criminalize homelessness. That's not really the premise of these of these lawsuits. The premise of these lawsuits is that these operations, especially MHA, and I think the, the two that are along the 4th Street corridor in our neighborhood, just based upon land use, they're in the wrong place, right? Nobody's saying that they shouldn't exist. I think their goal is a worthy one. I think it's something I think, as Ken was saying, we need to have, but it's not in the right location. It shouldn't be right up against single family homes and neighborhoods where kids and families can't go out and enjoy their properties, right? So that's really the goal here is how do we find a way for them to be compliant, good neighbors, or find a place where they are more compatible with their use. And that's why the shelter that we're building is over on the other side of the 55 freeway. It's on east, on, uh, east of the 55 freeway because we know it's not close to parks, it's not close to schools, and it's not close to neighborhoods. The use is still gonna happen because we need that. It's a regional problem and we're hoping that other cities will be, will follow our lead and be as responsible as we are, but in the meantime, that doesn't mean that by us providing services, we should allow them to be in places that are incompatible and are going to be affecting your quiet enjoyment, our quiet enjoyment of our neighborhood. So that's really my sort of, you know, goal here is to make sure that these operations are separated, right? And that's why we're going through a whole discussion on our general plan amendment is how do we create uh, buffers between these uses, right? How do we prevent these things from happening in the future where somebody, you know, comes in and they operate, they file for a business license and then they start conducting themselves differently. So that's really the goal here. I don't think it's to be punitive on places like Micah's Way or on any of the others. It's really to find a way that we can balance interests. But we can't, you know, provide a service that's needed at the cost of an entire neighborhood. That just is not going to work. Right? We have to find a solution to that, and we can find it so long as we can be open-minded about finding you know, relocations. This isn't like the city of Orange and what they're doing to Mary's Kitchen. They're just telling them to go away. We're saying, let's work with you. Let's work together. Let's see where we can find a place that folks like this and you know, my daughter, who's 16, who was alone in the home, in, you know, in our house, and somebody breaks in, and look, if I, if I don't get there within five minutes, something happens. So, you know, we don't want that to happen. So I think all of us can be, um, I think, compassionate but responsible in the way we conduct, um, you know, uh, relief and resource efforts. And I think that's all that people want to see. Got a question? Yes, sir. Mr. Mayor, I, I just want to say, you know, um, I, uh, I'm born and born in Santa Ana. I still born in Santa Ana. I went to high school here. Desi and I went to high school together. And uh, I've lived here in San Jose, except for my military career, San Ana has been my home. And I've seen major improvements over the past few years in San Ana. The rail, the light rail. I'm glad it's happening. Uh, it, it, I see the rail tracks going in. I know it's a, it's a, you know, it's an inconvenience now. But once it goes in, I think it's going to be a big positive and things are going to start to change in a very good direction, slower than I would like to see. But I know we have some social issues here we're working with. Um, but I do see improvements taking place, and, and now that you're the mayor, I know you've been on city council for, for a number of years. You know we're seeing some really good positive changes, and, and I don't want to compliment you on that uh, because uh, you know it takes a, a stern leadership, devoted leadership, 
if things move in a very dynamic environment that we're facing, you know, the streets are looking cleaner, now we're getting lights and, you know, things of that nature. So we're seeing quality improvement, improvement yeah. uh, slowly, but, but at the same time, you know, one thing I didn't like to see happen over there Lacey Street was the old Victorian home being torn down. But when I spoke to the gentleman that was in charge of it, we have no choice. The homes are so badly damaged, it, we, we have to do all three months to turn that. I wasn't in favor of that, but I understood that. So, you know, these are some of the things here that they were facing, especially I, I work in education, so I understand the education component of Stan Amos. The mayor of Brickett, who lived down the street from me where I used to live at, and I went to school with his daughters, and he had a philosophy on education, and it impacted Stan Amos because you know, all these high density homes. So, you know, we're seeing some changes here, and, and I like what I'm seeing. The light rail is a good start. I think it's going to make Santa Ana very more metropolitan. It is, and thank you for those, you know, for, for those words. I think the fact that, I mean, really to boil it down to everything, and I, I want everybody to ask their questions. So the, the issue that you're here for is so serious that you have almost every department represented here in this room listening to you taking notes, under, trying to understand how best to serve you in the short term, but also in the long term. Because we can't have the problem reoccurring in other neighborhoods. So we want to learn what we can do to correct what happened, you know, what's happening here, but also prevent it from happening any place else in the city. So um, I do think, and I do want to, you know, apologize for all the construction that's going on, but in the end, I think you're going to have a much, much, uh, you know, easier city to drive through, safer city to drive through, because unfortunately we just have a lot of traffic that comes through our city because we're the county seat. And we just want to make sure that everybody, and you know, our kids, you all get to enjoy, you know, the city soon, but uh, bear with us on the construction. I know the detours aren't fun. Do we have any questions on Zoom? Yeah. Okay. Okay, let's close it. Hi. How are you feeling that the homeless coming to your house breaking the bar three times in three months? Okay, the, just the lady. How do I feel about how would I feel if how would I feel if the homeless came in and broke into my house and broke into my car three times in three months? I'd be pissed off just like you are. I'm very mad. Three times. I understand. I understand. And that's why we have everybody here to listen to what this problem is and try to attack it from several different directions. Because fixing the homeless problem, we can't arrest ourselves out of this. We can't. So you have to try this angle, you have to try this angle, you have to try this angle, and eventually it gets better. It was better here. The amount of homeless individuals have dropped dramatically. And then the pandemic hit, and we saw a surge. I understand your frustration. I'm sorry. What questions? Can residents contact CityNet directly to respond to issues in our neighborhood? So that program is having a soft start tomorrow. That's the CityNet program for immediate response. Uh, we will be putting out press information and uh, information to your neighborhood association that will share it with all the phone numbers, emails, that kind of stuff. But in the interim, when you call the police department and report an issue involving the homeless, just like the police department transfers phone calls to the fire department, they will simply transfer that phone call directly to CityNet, and then CityNet will respond. So it's no change on your part right now. You have a problem with a transient-related issue, call the police. Any other questions, sir? I have a question on that. I think yes, it's sir. a great idea mm -hmm. that directly the phone call goes to the police station, not direct to city net. Because direct to city net, that was not successful in some cities. We've talked about different ways to do that. City net has a uh, program in Anaheim where they offer both services, right? They'll accept phone calls and transfers from virtually everybody. What we want to do to start out with and have people continue to call the police department is we want the police department and city net to work closely to understand what the capabilities are of city net. So as we triage calls, 
We can agree that's a city net only response. That's a police department and city net response. As we work through this over the next month, we'll get more comfortable with it as a city, as departments and a nonprofit working together. And then we will push out the phone numbers and get everybody more engaged in calling them directly. But I understand. And as Sergeant Montiel was saying, that's seven days a week, 365 days a year, from seven in the morning until nine at night. That's a huge amount of resources that your city council is dedicated again to this problem. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Boston, I, you want to make comments? I'm the person every morning go and pick up those syringes and try to pull him down and say, look, there's syringes I found. On Thanksgiving morning, I was the guy moving the trees from the street at 3 o'clock in the morning so people can drive. I love Linwood. That's a great street. I love the city of Santa Ana. That's a great city. When court enforcement came to me and said, where's the needle exchange? I yelled at him. Is that true, sir? I said, where do you think we are? We are there to help the people. We not only give a cup of coffee. We do birth certificates. We do ID vouchers. We do mailing. We have over a thousand people get the mail. I understand the frustration. I am the only nonprofit that nobody get paid. And I will be working for years with the police department, with the sergeant, Ken Kaminsky. I'm there in front of the jail at night. I see when the people come out of jail and they are from different cities and they stick around in Santa Ana and the RV called the Light Zone Program. So I understand. I help the children to pay for their books through donations, of course. We never get grants because we never ask for an ID. We help everybody. I understand that cup of coffee is a problem the windows of Micah's way broken three times since the syringe place. I'm not going to throw anybody down. I sent a letter to the mayor. I don't know if he received it or not, saying they need security people five days a week. I understand that. I am there to work with the neighborhood. That's my neighborhood. That's the most beautiful street, the houses. I there every morning saying hi to the people. When somebody leaves to go out of town, they come and they say to me, please keep an eye on my house, you know? So we are there to work together. Let's do it. Thank you. Any questions? You. Yes, sir. Just one last thing, as far as the local neighborhood is concerned, we sure would like to thank the mayor, the council, for taking out the handbook portion we had there that was drawing the wrong people. Okay, we thoroughly appreciate that. Again, thank you. It's great that we did now. Now we need now we need more playground equipment for the kids. Thank you, Sam. I used to play handball there many, many, many years. <laughs> so, anybody else from McClay here wants wants to share their experiences? Okay, I'll, I'll, so it, 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 yeah, Mike is very, you do an excellent job. You, you help people, you do what you need to do. And, and 
And um, when you do a good job at, when people come and pick your stuff, you tell them, if they're going to hang around in limbo, they tell them, go, you know, go, go somewhere else, okay? Because I know with the pandemic, you haven't been letting people in, they pick up their stuff at the sidewalk. Am I correct? Yes. Okay. The issue is that, yeah, they leave Linwood, but then they walk to McClay and they congregate on the corner of McClay where there's a continuation school. Trash, they eat there. It's intimidating for people who walk. And that's well, not only on at the school, on McClay, it's also at the corner of East Side. So yes, they leave Linwood. Once they leave that area, you have no control of that. And that's the problem, the major problem. Well, you know, I just, I'll give an anecdote here real quick. Um, there are three, every single day when I come home, there are at least three people on every corner of this place. And when they're gone, there is a pile of trash every single day. Thank you. I guess I have to start. <laughs> um, so anyway, you, you, the city, the staff, the attorney's office, we got a letter of numerous incidents that we um, logged in just by talking to people that experienced it. I mean, this lady that has her car broken into three times in three months, she is so frustrated. I feel so sorry for you. Um, have you had any, what kind of response did you get from the police? Um, we'll no, the, the lady in the back, I'm sorry. I know, don't have money to spend every time five hundred dollars. I'm not rich. No, we're not. And we feel for you. I mean like, obviously, the investment that people have to spend in, in cameras, you know, um deductibles for insurance. Yeah, I have cameras too. Sorry? Thank you for sharing that. Uh, so the staff is listening, and, and I, I look forward that things will improve. It's the world's move slowly, but being out there, speaking to our council members, our mayor, just calling. And, and you know, when you call the police, sometimes you feel like you're not giving attention. Always log the, the, the name that you talk to, the time, and if you're not getting any service right away, call back and talk to the launch commander. I mean, that's been my experience. Sometimes I get in a, a conference call with people and I can't speak English and we do a conference call. I might be out of town and we call me and so let's do a conference call with police. I mean, I, I've done that various times already. Um, and it works. And sometimes you do feel like police, you're the victim that makes you feel like the victim. Can you identify the person? Can you, you know, it's dark sometimes and you can't, you can't see. I can't really want to walk through that, up to that person. It's, it's right. So, anyways, thank you, staff. Thank you, city. Um, police, Mayor Sarmiento, Councilwoman um, Lopez, for being out here. And by the way, you know, I was at the Fort Park, West Fort Park meeting about three weeks ago. Councilwoman May, um, Lopez was there. And there are a number of issues also with the creek, the South Carolina Creek. So, it's just not our neighborhood. It's, Pretty much everywhere, you know, affecting every every income level in this city. And I don't want to stay in my city. I don't want to go anywhere. You know, I love Santa Ana. And like I said, Santa Ana has been improving. Um, I I walk to Santa to downtown. I see things improving. You know, more as the development comes in, we more lights. All the streets are going to be light. We light up with all these developments, and you, I'll feel I'll feel safer to walk to downtown. Because um, I've been doing that a lot with, obviously, I always do it with somebody else just in case. And you go for people who are shooting drugs. So far, I've not had any problems. They're very cordial sometimes. Give them some money for lunch or whatever. Actually, we do buy whatever. If we're carrying uh, food that leftovers from the downtown restaurants, we just give it to them back. 
Anyways, um, one more, anything else? I just said he's dropping his characters in Santa Ana. So that's being uh, addressed with the county and. And then you're not sitting here with your own candidate because you're dropping them off to the county. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for coming out. I appreciate it. The last drawing, if, does anybody want to say anything else? No? Okay, so one last drawing so we can close it up. Thank you guys. Thank you very much. Um, if you leave your cards, um, officer. That would be great. Here, I'll, I'll have you put in the next one. Yeah. 316. 316. 316. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you guys. Have a wonderful evening. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Hey, thanks for coming up. Take care. We'll see you. I'm from Trade Huh? I'm from Trade I know. I know, but you know, hopefully we'll get some attention. Three times. It's too much.